All right, we are back with Doug Rohan of Rohan Law. Some updates with Florida states and the ACC's cases here in Florida and North Carolina. Um, Doug, we'll jump right into it. I appreciate you for joining me. I appreciate you for always being flexible and available to do these, to update folks. We get a lot of comments and a lot of excitement on uh, just breaking this down in kind of layman's terms. Um, do we have really good news off the bat? Is Florida State saying the ACC now agrees with them and is – pointed out a couple of places and situations where they do or are we just done are we out of here because the ACC now agrees with Florida State yeah if you just read the introduction it would seem like basically the case is over we're done and we don't even need to have the other 127 pages of the complaint to to put behind it but no that's that's not really what's being said and we laid this out in our uh, tweets this morning uh, talking about what our analysis is of the amended complaint I have a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for this new second amended complaint which I anticipated would be the case we knew they would do a better job they would include some new arguments we knew the Florida State team had time to polish and review uh, their thoughts and, and look this is a practical reality of the practice of law. If you try a case twice, the same case, the same facts, the second trial is going to be better from both sides. Anytime you practice anything and you get an op another opportunity to do the same event again, it should improve. If it didn't improve, we would be concerned. Yeah. Uh, it's just so rare when you have as busy a work schedule as we have and as complicated complex trials as we have, it's rare to get a second chance to do the same thing over again. So here we were granted the opportunity by Judge Cooper to reestablish and restate what our complaints were. And I thought Florida State largely did a very, very good job of coming back to the table and readdressing what their issues were, including some of the new Clemson arguments that were brought in and really connecting the dots in a way that had not been previously connected. So it's kind of like when, you know, you, I don't know, like you miss a field goal, but the other team had called a timeout right before and you kind of get that free do over. Like <laughs> exactly. you made the mistake, like you missed the field goal, but you get another chance just kind of uh, because of something out of your control. So um, Florida, we, we started with that. You're, you're not necessarily in agreement that Talk to me a little bit about Florida State's tactic of saying that the ACC agreed with them and that they everybody's on the same page. We talked about that a little bit, but why is Florida State doing that and why do you not necessarily agree that all parties are on the same page there? It's a strategy. You want to point out, you know, first off, judges in general read hundreds if not thousands of pages a week so you want your your brief you want your complaint you want your writing to stand out separate from everything else obviously this is a high profile case we don't have too much of a concern as to making sure that the judges are paying attention in both north carolina and florida to this case in particular but you it's it, there's a degree of creative writing in this look i was an english major at florida state i did that specifically knowing i wanted to get into litigation there is some degree of wanting to make the writing interesting so that people are paying attention. And this was a easy way for Florida State to do that. Basically say, look, we've had several hearings on this matter. The ACC has had an opportunity to state its case and flesh out this position. And on multiple occasions, they have said the same thing we're trying to say. So what you say in court orally is part of the argument for sure, but what you take the time to think about and write and put in writing during these briefs that you submit is more valid and more, more uh, articulate in terms of what your argument is. So to misstate something or to, to state something that you wish later on that you maybe not didn't say uh, that happens in court periodically. And, and the judge knows that both parties know that, but it's an interesting way of Florida state saying, look, they've had their chance to have their arguments and two or three times they've agreed with what we're saying. So it's, it's an interesting way to get the, the reader hooked and to pay attention to what comes next in the case. It makes for a great tweet um, <laughs> to say that everything's done. Florida state and the ACC are on the same page We're we're almost wrapped up, but Maybe not so fast, as Lee Corso would say. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little about the long arm statute. I saw this a little bit in your tweets, uh, some of this dealing with jurisdiction. I saw in the argument that Florida State made. Let's start there. 
So this is where Judge Cooper rejected the earlier complaint, saying, look, there is a statutory method for suing somebody that lives outside of Florida. We need you to go ahead and make this argument more complete and more thorough. And it's a very simple argument. Is the other party doing business in the state of Florida? Well, obviously, the ACC is doing business in the state of Florida, but they didn't really say that. They alleged it, you know, they hinted at it, they talked around it. But the Judge Cooper said, no, if you're going to have a paragraph on jurisdiction, you need to lay out what that jurisdiction is. So I compared the first uh, complaint and the second uh, complaint, the first amended complaint that had literally seven lines, it had four one sentence paragraphs illustrating jurisdiction to now we have 13 pages Mm. of allegations just on the issue of jurisdiction and venue. So clearly the FSU team got the message and they laid out in very thorough detail exactly how the ACC was subjecting themselves to the long arm statute. Um, the ACC has some arguments in the North Carolina case as to why they deserve jurisdiction. Florida State now made their 13-page argument now You know, in this. Do you think one side holds more you know, credence? Do, you, do they both have good points? Like, if we take the garnet and gold off for a minute, like, where do you maybe fall on that? So towards the end of the um, tweet storm that I put out this morning, there is a uh, discussion on the new count five. So the new allegation in the complaint is specifically related to the uh, immunity clause and, and the idea that Florida State has sovereign immunity and is subject only to suit in Florida. And and we had laughed at this, you know, on, on a few times where I'm trying to be impartial to say, look, there's no there's no border that says. Florida State is only sued up to the the borders of Florida and and can't be sued outside. But there is some legitimacy here to what they're arguing and what they've put in place. We have a conflict of laws. That's something we haven't talked about a whole lot before because a lot of what we've been discussing has shown that North Carolina and Florida laws are very similar on contracts, on fiduciary duty, things like that. But here is an example of where we do have a conflict and it's related to this issue of jurisdiction. North Carolina and Judge Bledsoe put forth that the sovereign immunity statute doesn't apply here because there is an implied waiver. They, there's case law that they cited to that said because Florida State was doing business in North Carolina, there is an implied waiver of the sovereign immunity protection. Well, Florida statute says there cannot be an implied waiver. It can only be an express waiver in any contract. And therefore, this sovereign immunity statute prohibits Florida State from being sued in North Carolina. So we now have an argument from Florida State that says case law in North Carolina is not superior to statutes in Florida. This creates a conflict which resurfaces and recreates this idea that there may be something that does need to go to the federal Supreme Court to resolve. We've talked about full faith and credit and the race to the finish line and whoever decides the end of the case first has to be respected by the other state. But this is, again, one of those jurisdictional issues and is the foundation for what Florida State was saying back in North Carolina in front of Judge Bledsoe. If you don't agree with our interpretation, then maybe the Supreme Court of the United States will. Do you, um, is it really hard at this point to know how that will end up because of the conflict of, of views, laws, jurisdictions? Like, is it really, or will it just eventually get bumped up because of that? Well, North Carolina has the opportunity to agree with the FSU uh, legal team uh, with the, the North Carolina case going up to the North Carolina Supreme Court. It is possible that the North Carolina Supreme Court says, yeah, you're right. I don't think that's likely, but it is possible. And if they were to do so, then a order would come back down to Judge Bledsoe saying, we agree with Florida State. Sovereign, uh, sovereign immunity applies. Florida State cannot be sued in North Carolina. Judge Bledsoe, we're instructing you to dismiss the ACC complaint. That is one possible avenue of where this case is heading. But probably not likely for it to end up like that. I, I struggle to believe that it would be that easy. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, teams usually play all four quarters, right? Don't, don't, don't quit midway through the first. 
Um, let's talk a little bit about the grant of rights. Um, there are some in your tweets this morning, and, and this is a word that's been thrown around a ton for years, mm-hmm. talking about how ironclad the grant of rights is and, and what happened to uh, the rights, the, the, the TV rights, the media rights, if Florida State leads. Um, it's an argument that Florida State says both sides agree on, but neither side really agrees on um, at this moment. We're, what's your take on that? What's the argument there? So I've really come a long way on this thought process, on this logic storm, on this um, logic discussion since this start. Just like everybody else that was reading David Hale or any of the Atlantic articles, you said the grant of rights was ironclad. It sounds like it's ironclad. You're saying the grant of rights is irrevocable. Sounds sounds pretty solid to me. But once you start actually looking into the details, which is what we as attorneys do, we get into the weeds, we peel back the layers of the onion, you start to see how the dots are being connected. So what we start with here is first, the grant of rights is between the member institutions and the ACC. So Florida State grants its media broadcast rights to the ACC to allow them to negotiate on behalf of its members. You then have the ACC agreeing to an ESPN media deal that says we have the grant of rights from all of our members and we're going to maintain those grant of rights and our members have to comply with those grant of rights to do anything that is necessary for ESPN to broadcast those games. And then lastly, what we now have in this last bit of this uh, agreement um, contracts that Florida State and, and previously Clemson were pointing out is, okay, what happens then when a member leaves? What happens when a member decides to leave? So the language that we were po- focusing on before is the each member grants an irrevocable right to the conference, okay? But that irrevocable right is limited because it only applies to the agreement so long as ESPN is a member. So we've already shown one way that this is limited. Well, the other way that it's limited is that there is a composition clause suggesting that there must be 15 members. If there's 15 members in the conference, ESPN has to continue to abide by the agreement. But if that number drops below 15 members, then ESPN can say, whoa, 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 you guys are not valuable enough of a property, we're out. Well, if the ACC's argument was correct, and if the grant of rights kept those rights with the conference even after the member left, why would it matter if there were 15 members? Because you have the rights of 15 members. As soon as they sign that agreement, those rights are irrevocably with the ACC, even if the member leaves. The courts do not like superfluous language that doesn't make sense. So to have on the one hand, the composition clause, and on the other hand, the irrevocable right, there's a conflict there that the court is not going to like. So they're going to want to interpret it in a way that makes sense. What makes sense is that so long as Florida State is in the ACC, Florida State does not have the right to negotiate directly with ESPN because they've already given an irrevocable right to the ACC to negotiate on their behalf. However, if Florida State leaves, then Florida State is free to negotiate its own media rights with its other media partner possibilities. So those were the last pieces of the puzzle that I needed to connect this morning for me to feel comfortable that, yeah, Clemson and Florida State do seem to be making a rational argument on how and why this could all fall apart. So on one hand, just 30,000 foot, you've got the composition clause that says that if a member leaves, ESPN can break the contract because they don't, they're, they're, they don't have 15 members as rights. On the other hand, the ACC is saying, you leave, we hold your rights until 2036, and both things can't be true at the same time. Like, one of those two things has to be, you know, this shirt is either garnet or gold, right? Like it is one or the other. Actually, it's both. So maybe that wasn't the best example, <laughs> but the main part of the shirt that I got at garnet and gold, shout out them, uh, is garnet or gold. So the and the ACC can't have you know have your cake and eat it too, right? Where exactly. And so, um, where where do you fall with that? Like where where do you fall with you know again the the court won't necessarily like that. I assume they're gonna 
the ACC is going to have an argument. I am interested to see, I guess, what the ACC's mm-hmm. argument is to that. Like, how do you justify both things? How do you rationalize both things at the same time? That's kind of a, you know, uh, I'm full of cliches today, dad jokes, mm-hmm. but cut your hand in the cookie jar. Like, how do you, how do you explain that if you're the ACC? So where, I guess that leads you to the, okay, well, if you do leave and they, you know, they've talked about buying back your rights or you know, Florida State alleges that that's more of a penalty that would would be owed. Mm-hmm. The we've talked about the five hundred seventy one million dollar number, or maybe it's a le- you know something a little less that because of the actual exit fee. But it, it, that argument is very much tied into like, okay, well, if we can leave and they're trying to keep our rights to get the rights back, is that a penalty? We take our rights, but we owe this number. How how does that side of it tie in? Well, the ACC is going to have to shore up their arguments on why they think it is an irrevocable grant of rights in perpetuity, or at least through 2036. And that then gets into the theme that we were reading into this entire Second Amendment complaint, which is characterizing the North Carolina suit as a takings case. They're trying to allege that North Carolina is all about the intellectual property of Florida State. And if the ACC is really arguing what they're trying to argue, that further weakens the argument that this should be a North Carolina case because we're talking about Florida State's property being taken. So Florida State's property being taken should be an issue that is resolved in the state of Florida courts. So they're really starting to paint the box smaller and smaller for the ACC with each of these arguments in trying to establish that the interpretation that the ACC thought they had is not actually a, a logical possibility. Um, what's our, what's our, uh, from here, what are our next steps? Florida State not only filed their admitted complaint, but also, um, I was it late last week submitted to the, uh, submitted an appeal to, is it the North Carolina Supreme Court? Um, on what, <laughs> we'll say Coach Bledsoe, Judge Bledsoe, uh, said in football mode here. Uh, but, uh, what, what's our timeline now that we've gotten, another step into the process on this. So we have 20 days from the date that the order was, or from the date that the uh, complaint was filed, the second amendment complaint was filed. And I do remember it being May 16th. So 20 days from that date, the ACC's responsive pleadings are due. Now a response could be an answer, which would be the easiest and simplest way to move this case forward. Or we could see what we saw before, which was a motion to dismiss. So I anticipate we're going to go down that same route, have a motion to dismiss by the ACC, which will then prompt Florida State to have a supplementary filing as well, and then a hearing scheduled at some point 30 or 60 days after that in Florida to address the motion to dismiss or the motion to stay, both of which should be coming forward from the ACC. Tomorrow, or perhaps even this afternoon, today, we've got a hearing in North Carolina, which is a status conference. Um, or no, I think that the static conference is in Florida. So Judge Cooper, again, there is just saying, you know, where are the parties? It, that's probably what prompted this filing and this publication to occur before uh, the 22nd. Uh, he'll lay out again what his anticipated calculations are for his due dates. In North Carolina, we have a brief that's now been filed with the Court of uh, Supreme Court in North Carolina where they're asking, actually, I, I don't know that I've seen the actual brief. What happens is they file the notice of intent to appeal, and then they file the notice of appeal. And I think that's where we are now in North Carolina. So we have a notice of appeal. Briefs will follow shortly. That'll be something that we can get into to, to actually address what the arguments are. Uh, another thing is whether or not the North Carolina Supreme Court is going to take up the argument. It's not a guarantee. It's not mandatory. It's not obligatory. There is a right to have a court of appeals hearing on your matter, uh, but you don't necessarily have a right to the Supreme Court. Uh, so they can kind of act as gatekeepers and not waste their time with a bunch of unnecessary appeals. It will be interesting to see if the North Carolina Supreme Court takes up this issue. And then, of course, by then we're hurtling through August and September and this idea of either a look-in provision, which would be a passive act on the part of ESPN or a unilateral extension, as Florida State is arguing, that would be an active 
need for ESPN to determine by February of 2025 how they want to handle this conference contract going forward. So it was very interesting to see the comments that came out of uh, Amelia Island with the ACC meetings. And uh, that's one of the next big questions that get to be addressed. Is there a look-in provision or is there a unilateral uh, extension um, that's offered to ESPN? We'll have to see where that road goes. Yeah, Commissioner Phillips certainly um, downplayed that more than really anybody has. Like we 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 hype stuff up, right? Like we we <laughs> make stuff pretty big here. But even like Pate and and Dillinger and others, like I, I thought it was interesting that as soon as he said that, like Ross Dillinger of Yahoo Sports, like put out a story within hours, basically saying mm-hmm. like, no, that's that's not that's, <laughs> that's not, not what I've been told, happening. you know. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll do all the conspiracy theory stuff here, but I. I truly believe somebody with knowledge, whether that's at Florida State or ESPN or wherever, reached out and said, like, yeah, I don't I don't know that this is just a look, you know, we're just working on a we're ironing out some details is is what uh is how Phillips represented it. And it you know, it's like you forget your wife's anniversary and say, Ah, we're just I was waiting to surprise you the next day. Like, ah, it's not really <laughs> not really how that works. Why you to think that I forgot so that you could be yeah. so excited that I remembered a day late. <laughs> I want to really just put a whole 24 hours worth of emphasis on, on you. Um, so we'll see. I, you know, maybe he's right, but yeah, I, I tend to think that Peyton, everybody else that we've heard over the last year is, is probably the, the right party there. Um, Doug, as we start to wrap up close today, anything else high level, anything else intricate, however, that you want to discuss before we get out of here? Mm-hmm. Well, there are some things that are noticeably absent from the second minute complaint. It does appear that Florida State is not going after the same damages arguments that Clemson is going after in South Carolina. So Florida State is still arguing that the exit penalty is excessive and is contravening the the public policy and that the grant of rights is not valid. So they're still trying to get a decision from the court that they don't owe anything, but they're not going so far as Clemson did, which is to suggest that perhaps the ACC owes Clemson money for their actions in harming the value of their property and and the value of their prior titles. So I thought that was something that was interesting. We're not working in lockstep with Clemson. We're not just copying and pasting their complaint. The the attorneys are still thinking for themselves and, and working on their own best arguments or what they think are their own best arguments. Yeah, some overlap there, but honestly, it's probably better to be a uh, ultimate homer here. Probably better to be a little bit diverse, right? Because you just need to win. Mm-hmm. One of these two lawsuits needs to win on one thing, right? And so if your arguments are copy pasted, I don't know. If one gets, if one goes over, the other one's probably going to go over. So it, maybe not the worst thing to, to not copy every single step. Now, there are some good moves that they've made, some good moves that I think we've made that both parties will kind of blend a little, but maybe a good thing to not be mirror images. I don't know. Again, Mm -hmm. ultimate homer here, but I'll let you give a take on that and we'll wrap up. Yeah, they mean the the new Second Amendment complaint is exponentially better than the prior complaints. The arguments are more succinct and they're more well connected. Uh, it, It is laid out in a way that provides a foundation for this case to proceed and to increase the likelihood of success. So uh, I'm proud of what, you know, the Florida state attorneys and Greenberg trial have done on this uh, through this process. I know some people are disappointed that as to how we got here, but you know, you can't change the past. You can't redo uh, things that have already been done. You just make the most and the best out of the current situation. And uh, they've done a good job of doing that here. So uh, we'll see what, Uh, the ACC files next in uh, 17 more days and you and I'll hop on and talk about those and uh, we'll, we'll see where it goes from there. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about Rohan law and we'll wrap up. Yeah. Atlanta, Georgia based firm handling criminal defense and work accidents. So if you know a friend or family member that's in Georgia, a Clemson buddy that, that lives out, uh, lives in Atlanta, we're getting a lot more Clemson followers as well. Uh, please do let them know that you've got somebody that very clearly likes to get into the details of the law and be meticulous and is willing to put in the time on the cases 
uh, that each of my clients need. We, we work very hard to represent them with the excellence that we've shown here uh, with you all. And uh, if you ever find yourself in trouble, uh, either being arrested or getting a speeding ticket and uh, getting hurt at work, then we're here in Georgia to make sure that we come alongside you. And we want to be your best friends on your worst day. You don't want to have to call me, uh, but if your Monday morning is starting off with a phone call into Rohan Law, we know that it has not been a particularly pleasant time. So we and our staff want to come alongside you and help you out. Awesome. Make sure you're following Doug, uh, Rohan Law PC on Twitter, X, whatever you're calling it. You can follow other places as well, but if you want to stay updated um, on the on the case, Instagram, Facebook, maybe not your best avenues, go to Twitter or X, um, and you can find all of Doug's thoughts there. Uh, it goes into more detail sometimes than we can even do uh, here on the videos, but these the, 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 we really do appreciate your time. Appreciate you hanging out with us. Uh, people really, really enjoy these. If you, um, are watching this, if you made it all the way through the, the video, make sure that you're subscribed. That helps the channel and the algorithm some as well. Um, Doug, I'll let you get a couple hours of work done so that we can hopefully watch a baseball win here, uh, in Charlotte against Georgia tech this week afternoon. I appreciate you a ton for hanging out. Go Knowles. That sounds great. Take care. Have a good one.